If you have your Bible, turn to the book of 1 Peter chapter 1. 1 Peter chapter 1. It's toward the end of the Bible. Okay? Near Revelation. You're going to find, if you go backwards, you're going to find the book of Revelation. Not Revelations, but Revelation. Then you're going to find 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. And then just right before that, you'll find 1st and 2nd Peter. Which we believe in the Christian church that it was written by the Apostle Peter. One of Jesus' main disciples. He was one of his, his right-hand men. He was part of the inner circle of Jesus. Those of you who know the word, you know that Peter, James, and John were a part of that inner circle of Jesus. He really poured out his heart into these three. They were beloved among all the disciples of all the, actually, 13 disciples, because we added um, Matthias after Judas passed away. But um, Peter, um, he had a special place in Jesus' heart. Amen? And so he wrote this letter to all of the Christians who were in the diaspora. Diaspora was the place where um, it, it's what it, we call um, the movement or the Christians away from Jerusalem into the Roman world because they were, um, they were receiving poor treatment um, in the, the high Christian cities and areas. And um, the Christians were being persecuted. And so they were scattered into the diaspora. Chapter 1, verse 1. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to God's elect, strangers in the world. Somebody say strangers. Scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, who have been chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father through the sanctifying work of the Spirit for obedience to Jesus Christ and by the sprinkling of his blood. Grace and peace be yours in abundance. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he's given us new birth into a living hope. Somebody say hope. Through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. And into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil or fade, kept in heaven for you, who through faith are shielded by God's power unto the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. Somebody say amen. In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. These have come so that your faith of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may be proved genuine and may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Somebody say amen. Though you've not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy. For you are receiving the goal of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Concerning the salvation, Peter says, and he continues, the prophets who spoke of the grace that was come to you searched intently and with the, great care, the greatest care, trying to find out the time and circumstances to which the Spirit of Christ in them was pointing when he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the glories that would follow. It was revealed to them that they were not serving themselves but you. When they spoke of the things that have now been told you by those who have preached the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven. Somebody say amen. amen. Even angels long to look into these things. Peter is breaking it down. Therefore, somebody say therefore. That means there's an argument that he's wanting to make a point. Prepare your minds for action. Be self-controlled. Set your hope fully on the grace to be given you when Christ Jesus is revealed. As obedient children, do not conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance before you knew God's word. 
But just as he who called you is holy, somebody say holy. So be holy in all that you do. For it is written, be holy because I am holy. We ain't done yet. Since you call on a father who judges each man's work impartially, live your lives as strangers here in reverent fear. For you know that it was not with perishable things such as silver or gold that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your forefathers. But with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. He was chosen before the creation of the world, but was revealed in these last days for your sake. Through him, you believe in God who raised him from the dead. And glorified him. And so your faith and hope are in God. Now that you have purified yourselves by obeying the truth. So that you have sincere love for your brothers. Love one another deeply from the heart. For you have been born again. Not of perishable seed but of imperishable. Through the living and enduring word of God. Somebody say the living word. For all men are like grass and all their glory is like the flowers of the field. The grass withers and the flowers fall. But the word of the Lord stands forever. And this is the word that was preached to you. One of the greatest coaches that ever lived, his name was John Wooden. He was a basketball coach at UCLA. Go Bruins. He won 10 national championships. That's not easy to do. John Wooden. John Wooden was a man of God. He was a believing man. His wife was named Esther. He never forced his faith upon his teammate, uh, his players. Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, who was Muslim, played for John Wooden. He never forced his faith upon Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. But he was a man of God. He was a man of the word. And he lived his life with integrity. There's a reason why he's the greatest coach that ever lived. Every season, with a new group of players, he would bring them together at their very first practice. I should have had a basketball with me. He would grab the basketball and he'd say, gentlemen, this is a basketball. Some who didn't know who John Wooden was or his antics probably thought to themselves, who does this guy think we are? How do you think we got here? But the wise would have stuck with John Wooden, their coach, as he rallied together a new group of men Every season at the brink of a new season, they had to go after this goal of winning the championship all over again. And they won 10. This is a basketball. This is a basketball court. He began with the fundamentals, not assuming that everybody on the court knew everything he wanted to teach them about basketball. He would go over the rules of basketball so that he would review the basics so that they could all have a common ground and a starting place from which to begin their journey or their season. When I was with the Los Angeles Dodgers, Maury Wills, the greatest base stealer that ever lived, the first one to steal 100 bases in a season. He was the, the base running instructor for the Los Angeles Dodgers for about 20 years. And the two seasons that I was at spring training, he would bring all of the, the burners, all the guys who could run. I was one of them. Ran a 6.5 in the 60, a 4.5 in the 40. I could steal some bags. I could go from first to third on a base hit. I could score from first base on a, a ball hit in the gap. I could run, but I couldn't hit for much power. 
Maury Wills would bring us together at 7 a.m. We had to get up before everybody, have our breakfast at, at, um, at Bureau Beach at Dodger Town. We'd have to be there early before everybody. Maury Wills, he'd come, he'd, he'd make his way onto the field. It'd be still covered, Bermuda grass with the Florida dew. Spring training, come March. And he'd say, gentlemen, this is a baseball. And this here, this is a bat. This here where I'm standing, this is home plate. Now come and walk with me now. And we'd have to walk with Maury Wills. He was in his upper 60s, early 70s during those couple years. He'd get the first place and he'd say, gentlemen, this is first base. And he'd walk us all the way to second base and he says, and this is second base. He'd go to third and he'd bring us back to home before he began his instruction. Somebody say amen. We cannot take for granted the word of God. Every year, every day, every week, we must remind ourselves of the fundamentals of the faith. If you want to be successful at whatever it is you're setting out to do in your faith, you must go back to the basics. Peter in his letter Here in 1 Peter, to God's elect, strangers in the world. Somebody say strangers. He's writing this letter. Peter being a disciple of Jesus, a follower of Christ, keeping close to the doctrine of Christ, the person of Christ, was entrusted with the great responsibility of communicating this same gospel to now his disciples. Are you following me so far? Imagine if Peter was writing this letter to strangers, people who were in the diaspora, people who were scattered away from those whom they knew, whom they loved, scattered away from um, um, their, their hometowns. Imagine if Peter was writing them a letter and he didn't start with the basics. He didn't start with the fundamentals, but started off on some, some side Side note, starting off on some tangential point of the gospel and began his teaching or his reminding or his letter with all of those things instead. They would have been further and further removed from the essentials of the faith. They would have been further removed from the truth, from the gospel. Are you, are you, are you with me? Are you, are you following what I'm saying? These two great men, John Wood and Maury Wills, started with the basics. In other words, as funny as it may have seemed, every year they did the same thing. But there was a method to their madness. There's a method to Peter's madness. There's a method to, to the books of the Bible that seem redundant. There's a redundancy there for a purpose. There's, there's a redundancy, there's a rep repetition there for a purpose, to drive home a main point. And the point that I believe God has for us today is that Jesus Christ, somebody say Jesus Christ, is the living word. Turn to your neighbor and say Jesus is the living word. There's a few things that I'd like to uh, drive home today. Number one, number one, the, the first point that I'd like to make is that the living word of God is comforting. The living word is comforting. The second is this, that the living word is necessary. The third point is this, that we must have respect for the living word. And lastly, the living word is the fundamental building blocks for successful Christian living. You want to just be a believer or you want to be a disciple? It's my question for us today. I pray by the end of today's message, things will be a little clearer for us as we begin 2019. Amen? The theme for this year is the living word. And our goal is to make it through the Bible in some way, shape, or form in the next 50 some odd weeks. making sure that we are not biblically illiterate. 
but that we become more proficient in God's word so that we can become more confident in God's word so that we can be steeped in the things of God's word and of faith. So that we will know God's word and we'll be able to live out God's word and not just be hearers of God's word. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. For anybody who's listening or paying attention, you know that whenever somebody like a father or a mother keeps telling you the same thing, you know that it's actually comforting when you hear them say them. It's comforting. You know that. The things that have been taught to you, have been given to you and and issued to you with the expectation that you're going to respect the things that are said and that you're going to hold them in such high esteem in reverence. Amen. Thirdly, we're going to see that the fundamentals, these basics are so necessary for the faith. And they prevent us from growing distant from God. The word of God will do that. The word of God will keep us close. To not begin with the essentials here at the head of the year would not make sense. But for us at Mission Ebenezer, I promise to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help me God. Number one. The living word is comforting. Peter was leaning into the faith that was handed down to him. Peter, when he followed Jesus, he followed in such a way where he would mimic Jesus' decisions, his lifestyle, the way he lived, the things that he said. Peter made his fair share of mistakes. We often say that Peter is our biblical punching bag. He's the one that's made so many mistakes in the New Testament that we say, oh, man, Peter. Oh, shucks, Peter. But I'm so glad that we had Peter. Amen. Because Peter bounced back. Peter bounced back. Peter would take one on the jaw and then he'd bounce back. I want us to be bounce back Christians. I don't want us to stay down when you take one squarely on the chin. We've all made our fair share of mistakes. Don't shout me down now, church. Peter was a part of the inner circle of Jesus. The living word is unto us a rod that is planted beside a baby tree. The rod is there to bring comfort to the tree. If the rod wasn't there, there could be the the chance that this baby tree would begin growing sideways or crooked or creaky, as my friend used to say. Hey, it's cricket, man. It's cricket. <laughs> the rods that come alongside a baby tree are comforting to the tree so that it could grow upright, so that it could stand tall, so that it could withstand the winds and the storms of life. How many of you enjoyed that storm last night or, or didn't enjoy it? <laughs> My boys went swiftly under the covers. <laughs> Judah. Come on over to daddy's bed. Judah jumped in the bed, crawled from the bottom of the bed under the sheets, and he was right there, right next to me. To withstand the storms of life. Peter was writing this book to an audience that was scattered all throughout the Roman world. Watch this. Left to their own demise or devices, they would have a lack of understanding. They would have lack of truth. They would have lack of instruction. They would have a lack of faith. Somebody say amen. Because it would have been devastating for them to have to to pull up anchor, go to wherever they made their new home, and then not have the essentials in place to continue growing in Christ. To continue growing in the word of God. They didn't have established churches there around 60 A.D., When the people left to the diaspora, lots of times they were the ones starting their own churches. They were the ones going to start church plants all over the world, wherever they were scattered. Imagine not having a whole Bible that they could take place. Imagine not have a a, a manual that they could take with them. So this letter that Peter wrote to them was, was the living word of God. It was the living word of God that was being delivered right to them. 
for them so that they could have good doctrine, so that they could have sound teaching, so that they could lean into what Peter was saying. And I don't know if you remember what we just read right now. How many of you remember? Wasn't that some good stuff? That was amazing stuff. It's like Peter was pulling from all the great, the great things that were in Scripture into this one chapter. Starting out this first letter on the right foot. He's writing to them so that the word of God might find them and re-anchor them, re-establish them wherever they were transplanted, that they could be transplanted in soil that would be receptive to their roots. So that they could be re-established in a new world, in a foreign place. The Bible says they were strangers. Somebody say strangers. I don't know about you, if you've ever been to a place where you've been a stranger, it's different. It's different. I don't know if you've ever been on your own before, had to travel, drive a long distance to go someplace. There's some spooky places. I've been a stranger before. Have you ever been a foreigner in another country? Ever been a place where you don't speak the language? But how comforting is it when you go into a place and all of a sudden you hear somebody speaking your language? I was in Mexico a couple years ago. We went to the Starbucks. It was like Spanish everywhere else in town. You know, you try to make deals and they're like, no, I, no hablo inglés. It's just so that they can, you know, you don't pull a fast one over them. But the minute you go to Starbucks, it's like, hello, may I take your order? We're like, yes, I'm a pocho. And my Spanish is terrible. It's comforting. It's comforting. When we're strangers, when we're foreigners, to have things in our lives. When kids are, are going to school for the very first time, kids need something to give them comfort. Sometimes they need a little blankie. They need a little stuffed animal. You guys know what I'm talking about? They want to know that daddy's not too far, mommy's not too far. Peter's letter brought so much comfort to the churches that were being established all throughout the Roman world. In Galatia, Pontus, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. Peter was trusting that the Holy Spirit would continue with them. But along with the power of the Holy Spirit, we need the word of God. We can't just have all spirit and no word. You can't just have no all word and, and no Holy Spirit. We can't just have preaching and no teaching. We can't just have teaching and no preaching. The two go hand in hand. You can't just have evangelism and no unity. You got to have unity and mission, right? Peter's writing to the people that have been scattered. Somebody say scattered. Somebody say strangers. He wants to comfort them with the rule, the standard, the rod, upright. The word of God that is just, that when they start getting off base, guess what? They can go back to the word. They can go back to Peter's letter and, 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 and pull open what Peter wrote and say, oh, oh, no, this is what Peter said. And they will go back to teaching the things that Peter taught them. Somebody say amen. amen. That's why we need the word of God. Don't try to do this thing on your own. I know you're not, you're not meaning to do it. I know we're not meaning to do it. I know we're not meaning to just go every day and not spend time in God's word. I know we don't mean to do it. We have good intention. We have good intentions. But we got to go beyond having good intentions now. I'm sorry. It's time for us to grow up some more. It's time for us to grow up some more. It's time for us to grow up in God's word. It's time to stop making excuses or reasons. We need to know God's word. We got to get into God's word so God can use you to deliver God's word. These letters that Paul wrote, I don't know if I'm preaching to anybody today. 
They help pull these people through some tough times. You ever read a letter over and over again? Sweet Boomy. You know, she was pulling that letter out all the time. Don't tell her I said that, all right? But when I was playing ball and I was gone for six months at a time, we would write in this journal and send it back to each other with pictures and new letters and, and little journals until we sent it back. I mean, I pull that out, like, look back at the picture that she sent. She fine. I love you more than ever. I read that over and over again. It brought me so much comfort. Just, that's what Peter's doing right here. He sent the love letter to the, to the churches in Pontus, Cappadocia, and Asia, Bithynia. How many are with me so far? Number two, the living word is Jesus Christ. The living word is necessary. Without the living word, we lose touch. Without the living word, we lose touch. We forget who we are. We forget what we believe in. We forget uh, what we have committed ourselves to. We forget who we're devoted to. We forget who we serve. We forget our purpose. The church, without the word of God, the church would, would lose its purpose. It would just become a social club. Amen. Not even a sanctified one. We would become incestuous. We would become so ungodly and secular and so off base and off target. The church, there would be sin running rampantly through the church, through the hallways and the corridors of churches all around the world. If the church did not have the word of God, it would lose its substance. It would lose its place. Somebody say amen. Because God has a place in this world for the church. Because the church was meant to be the herald of the word of God. The church was meant to bring forth the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ, which is to say God loves you. So he sent his son Jesus to die on the cross for your sins and for my sins, by the way, so that we can be redeemed by the blood of Jesus, by the blood of the lamb, the only perfect sacrifice so that we can have a relationship with him like we never had before. So it's necessary. The living word is necessary. It's a necessary conduit. It's a necessary conduit between the sender and the receiver. The sender and the recipient. It's a necessary conduit of blessing from the heavens to the earth. From God to man. It's a necessary medium between God through the Son unto us. From the Creator to the created. A conduit. We lose touch with friends when we don't connect. Somebody say amen. amen. When God wants to teach us his ways but we ain't in his word... How much more difficult is it, is it for us to learn his words when the Bible says his ways are so much greater than ours. As high as the heavens are from the earth, so are my ways greater than your ways. If God's ways are so much greater than ours and it's difficult for us to comprehend him to begin with, let alone without the word of God in our lives, That's why we suffer. That's why we really struggle. That's why we really make mistakes and keep going back to the same mistakes. We go back to the, the old things that God was trying to remove from our lives. God's been trying to get a hold of us the whole time, but we ain't listening. There's some static between the sender and the receiver. Yesterday in the storm, some of you may have lost a signal on your TVs. You may have lost a signal. On your TV it says, lost signal. And you were like, bummer. My mom said when she and my dad were driving up to Northern California, they, they were driving up to Seattle. Yesterday they stopped at a hotel. They were watching the game. At the very end of the game when the Seahawks scored their last touchdown to try and, try and come back from the end like they always do. Didn't have enough. They ran out of time. Had we had another quarter, we would have won that thing. 
Still haven't let it go yet. Pray for me. Pray for me. My mom texted the whole family. We just lost the signal. We lost reception. We didn't see the last two minutes of the game. We're like, bummer. How can you get rid of the sin that's in your guys' lives that is preventing the signal to go from the sender to the receiver? Sometimes the sin, the things that we struggle with in our lives cause us to lose the signal. Therefore, the word of God is necessary. The word of God is the very thing that connects us to our creator. It's the very thing that keeps us grounded. Somebody say grounded. It's the very thing that, that keeps us grounded. It's necessary. Somebody say necessary. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. For being the living word. So I think the Lord is trying to teach us that not only are we going to learn God's word better than ever before this year, but we're going to deal with this thing called disobedience. We're going to deal with this thing called sin. We're going to spell it with a lowercase s. We're going to spell Jesus with a capital J. We're going to defeat the devil by the blood of Jesus and the word of God. Three times Jesus was tempted when he came out of the wilderness in preparation for his ministry. Now, if Jesus had to go and pray and fast to prepare himself for ministry, how much more should we be on our, our best? Praying, fasting, taking the spiritual things seriously. I don't need to pray. I don't need to fast. I don't need to spend that much time in my word. As long as I just go to church, I, you know, I'll take it from them. I'd rather take the word of the butcher than you know what? Number three, what was John Wooden, what was Maury Wills trying to emphasize with their pupils? Watch this. You're going to love this. Young people, pay attention. Pay attention. Cameramen, pay attention. Respect the game. Respect the game. Respect the word of God. Respect the living word of God. Peter had to trust that he was going to send a letter halfway across the world and that that letter was actually, actually going to re reach its destination. First of all, they had the required faith. Once the letter got to where it was meant to go, peep, peep game. Peter had to communicate in, in, in such a way where he could develop something that the people could grasp, that they could hold on to, and that they would actually have respect for. He had to trust that they were buying in to the system. They, he had to trust that they were buying in to the doctrine that he was teaching and he was preaching and that he was living. Somebody say amen. He had to teach them to have respect for it. And that is so crucial in our day and age. Because so many of us will take the, 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 the tradition, the good traditions of old, and we'll just trample all over them. Boom, boom, boom. No respect. Some of us look at our, our elders, our parents, and be just be like, boom, boom, boom. No respect. Some of us are raised in a culture of love. Lots of love, lots of affirmation. But guess what? When it comes to the big R, respect, there's a lack of respect for others. There's a lack of respect for, for, for people. There's a lack of respect for what other people do. There's a lack of respect for what other people do for an occupation or a career. Oh, you know, when you grow up, you don't want to be like this, man. Respect every job that every, anybody does. Respect every person, no matter who they are. Whether they're a stranger, whether you're living in a strange land, have respect for people. Where does it begin? By having a healthy dose of respect for God and for his word. If we have a healthy dose of respect and reverence for God, who is the living God, then we're going to have a healthy respect and reverence for the living word of God. Therefore, that translates into us having a greater respect for humankind. Can I get a little, can I get a little green on us real quick? We might even have a little respect for this earth. We may not litter and throw trash out the window. That's not biodegradable. 
My boys think I'm crazy everywhere we go. I can't take two steps without picking up trash. Dad, you weird, bro. Shut up. Go pick that piece of trash up right there. Don't come back till you got 10 in your hands. <laughs> respect. Somebody say respect. <laughs> and part of respect is obedience. Let me see how many parents we got in the house. How many parents? Raise your hand. Raise your hand. Let me see. Let me see. A lot of parents. Look around. Look around. Lots of parents. Lots of parents. If your kids only came to you when they wanted something and didn't have any respect or obey what you said, would you be okay with that? There wouldn't be any point to you being a father or a mother or a guardian or a parent if there was no reciprocation of love and respect. But watch that obedience. Only come and butter up with, you know, come up and butter me up when, when they want, uh, you know, a Finsky. My son come to me, Dad, can I get 20 bucks? What do you need 10 bucks for? Five bucks? Man, here you go. I just worked them all the way down. Kids, I'm trying to, I'm trying to help you out too. You want more blessings? You want more anointing? You want more favor with your parents? You want more liberties? You want more freedom? Then do what they say. And do it the first time, not the tenth time they have to tell you to do the thing. It's a little parenting 101 right there. Bang, bang. That was for free. Next one, I'm going to charge you. It don't work like that. You want the 20 bucks? Do what I say. Clean your room. Put your dirty chonas away. I ain't touching them disgusting things. I'm serious. My son came back from youth convention. No, this one ain't on him. This one, it ain't on him. And then we went on a family vacation this past December. And I went in his toiletry bag, I grabbed the soap, I started cleaning. I go, man, you got hair under your arms already, buddy? He goes, dad, I never use that soap. How many roommates did you have at the convention? Six. I don't know whose hairs those were. I think I took like an hour long shower that day. Thank God we were on vacation. I'd have to go nowhere. What's the point of having a father? You ain't going to obey him. What's the point of having the word of God? We ain't going to obey it. Learning respect is good practice. Somebody say amen. amen. Look what it says in, in verse 17. Since you, you call on a father who judges each man's work impartially, live your lives as strangers here in reverent fear. We're going to have high reverence for God and his word and the things of God. We're going to have a great respect for the things that God has blessed us with. Amen. I know we're having a good time tonight, but uh, today, but, but, but the, the truth of the matter is God wants to do some crazy things in us and in you and through, uh, through our church, but it ain't going to happen if we ain't obedient to him. It's not going to happen if we don't take the things of God seriously or if we don't get deeper and deeper into God's word, falling in love with God's word to the point where, where we don't even say anymore, man, I have to get in God's word. It's like, no, I get to get in God's word. I get to spend time with the Lord in prayer, in communion, in relationship, in dialogue, in communication with him. Somebody say amen. Because it's from that communication and that intimacy where all the good things come, you won't even have to ask for 20 bucks. Pops and moms going to be like, hey, where are you going? Boom, here's 50, homie. And that's how God wants to be in your life. He's waiting to see if you could be trusted with the things of God, with the things of heaven. He wants to see that when nobody is watching and in the dark places, watch this, in the dark, if we're, we are living our lives with integrity, where if the word of God is, is the banner over your home, you don't got to say it. You don't got to act. You don't got to fake the funk. You don't got to pretend that you're doing it. People will know. God will know when you are in line with God. People will know when the signal is, is in full strength and the, 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 the sender is connecting to the recipient, to the receiver. Because then guess what? We will begin 
to see the big picture. Then we will see what God is trying to do. You'll get the whole panoramic. You'll start seeing the whole thing, not just small bits and pieces. He says, no, I want to I show you the big picture. Let's just, let's keep, let's keep, <clears throat> let's stay in alignment. The book of Proverbs chapter one, verse seven says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Somebody say amen. amen. Respect for God, respect for his word, respect for one another, respect for perfect strangers, respect for this earth. And lastly, number four, the living word is the building blocks for successful Christian living. Let's this year get our houses in order. Let us this year put the spiritual first. Don't worry about the financial. If you put the spiritual first, the financial will follow. Because the Bible is full of principles in here that will teach you how to be successful. Teach you how to make a lot of money if that's something you want to do. You want to make a million dollars? Go ahead. If you live according to God's word, God wants to bless you when he sees that he can trust you with the things and the blessings of heaven. But if, we be, if, if we're greedy and if we go about doing things and stepping on people and just trying to get mine and I'm just going to go and do this. And guess what? He's going to be like, I'm just withholding because you're one of my own. You're not somebody out there in the world that's just going to do whatever. Hey, I'm, I, if they want to make millions, they're going to make millions their way. But if you're one of my children, I want you to know that I discipline my children. I want you to know that I chastise my children when they're wrong. I correct them. I want you to know that there are consequences for the mistakes that you made. I love you. I do forgive you. But you are going to have to work through some of those areas of your life that you're not submitting or surrendering to me. Because of lack of obedience. And that word is for all of us. Matthew 6.33 says, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all of these things shall be added unto you. In other words, when you put Jesus first, when you put the word of God first, everything will fall into place. It's like God number one, everything else second. I mean, family should be right there. You know what I mean? Everything else is like, make up your own order after that. God will bless it. God will bless it when you're in line with him, when you're walking with him. takes discipline to serve Jesus in the Christian life. Otherwise, we'll be like Peter, concerned that the churches would be too free, too loose, too far, too far gone to bring back. Too lost to be found. Thank God the Lord had mercy on all of us.